Hi, good morning. Hydraulic fracturing is a well stimulation technique in which rock is fractured by a pressurized liquid. The process involves the high pressure injection of fracking fluid, primarily water containing sand or other propumps suspended with the aid of thickening agents into a well bore to create cracks in the deep rock formations through which natural gas, petroleum, and brine will flow more freely. When the hydraulic pressure is removed from the well, small grains of hydraulic fracturing propants, either sand or aluminum oxide, hold the fractures open. Hydraulic fracturing began as an experiment in 1947, and the first commercially successful application followed in 1950. As of 2012, 2.5 million frac jobs had been performed worldwide on oil and gas wells. Over 1 million of those within the U.S. Such Treatment is generally necessary to achieve adequate flow rates in shale gas, tight gas, tight oil, and coal seam gas wells. Some hydraulic fractures can form naturally in certain veins or dikes. Hydraulic fracturing is highly controversial in many countries. Its proponents advocate the economic benefits of more extensively accessible hydrocarbons. Opponents argue that these are outweighed by the potential environmental impacts, which include risk of ground and surface water contamination, air and noise pollution, and the triggering of earthquakes, along with the consequential hazards to public health and the environment. Increases in seismic activity following hydraulic fracturing along dormant or previously unknown faults are sometimes caused by the deep injection disposal of hydraulic fracturing flowback, a byproduct of hydraulically fractured wells and produced formation brine, a byproduct of both fractured and non-fractured oil and gas wells. For these reasons, hydraulic fracturing is under international scrutiny, restricted in some countries and banned altogether in others. Environmental Issues of Fracking While fracking has increased the U.S. domestic energy supply and provided economic benefits, it has not come without controversy. Many citizens and scientists have become increasingly concerned with fracking, citing potential drinking water contamination, as well as occupational safety hazards and extensive toxic air emissions which contribute to climate change. Over 8.6 million people are served by drinking water supplies in close proximity to fracking wells, making drinking water contamination a prime concern. In 2010, these concerns caused Congress to commission EPA to complete an in-depth study detailing fracking's association with drinking water contamination. EPA 
identified five different processes in the fracking water cycle that could serve as mechanisms for drinking water contamination. First is the water acquisition. Each fracking well requires an immense amount of water to effectively extract natural gas. On average, 1.5 million gallons per well. Some areas of the United States are fortunate to have abundant water resources, but concern is growing over the sheer volume of water used by the extraction process and potential impacts to other water users, including agriculture, ecological needs, and urban users. In areas where water scarcity is more prevalent, such as Texas or California, fracking poses an even greater threat to water resources. Second is chemical mixing. Thousands of chemicals are contained in the fracking fluid. Many of these chemicals have potential health impacts, including, according to EPA, carcinogenesis, immune system effects, changes in body weight, changes in blood chemistry, cardiotoxicity, neurotoxicity, liver and kidney toxicity, and reproductive and developmental toxicity. While proper safety measures can dramatically reduce the potential for human exposure to these mixtures, EPA has found that chemical spill rates can reach 12.2%, reaching surface water in 9% of spills and contaminating soil in 64%. Well injection. EPA reports that the most common cause for water contamination in the well injection phase is failure of the cement casings surrounding the well. The report describes two instances where inadequate or insufficient cement casings led to pollutants including methane and benzene reaching drinking water sources. Despite these two cases, EPA concludes that this component of the fracking process is unlikely to cause groundwater contamination due to the properties of the fracking chemicals and of the surrounding geologic formations. Significantly, EPA did mention that all their, that all their wells were at much higher risk for cement casing failure raising the concern that even if well injection currently poses a limited threat to drinking water, future impacts caused by aging infrastructure could be significantly greater. Flowback Most of the fracking fluid remains in the rock formations, but 10 to 25% of it returns to the surface as flowback, commonly referred to as produced water. Between 2006 and 2011, EPA reports that there were 225 spills of flowback water with a median volume of 990 gallons. The majority of these spills were a result of surface storage container failure. Additionally, the EPA found that 8% of these spills reach surface or ground water. To date, the largest flowback spill occurred in North Dakota, where 2.9 million gallons spilled from a broken pipeline, impacting both surface and ground water. Wastewater Treatment and Waste Disposal A 2000 survey indicated that 98% of wastewater 
generated by oil and gas wells is managed by the UIC or un underground injection control wells where the wastewater is disposed of by injecting it deep underground. The EPA reports that disposal wells are also the primary management practice for hydraulic fracturing wastewater. Despite this, EPA states that studying the impact of UIC wells, underground injection control wells, on drinking water was outside the scope of its assessment. This is because the 2005 Energy Policy Act exempts UIC wells for oil and gas production from regulation under the Safe Drinking Water Act. This exemption is commonly referred to as the Halliburton loophole. An extensive review of UIC wells by ProPublica, a nonprofit that conducts investigative journalism, found that structural failures in UIC wells are routine. Oil sands, also known as tar sands, or more technically, bituminous sands, are a type of unconventional petroleum deposit. Oil sands are either loose sands or partially consolidated sandstone containing a naturally occurring mixture of sand, clay, and water saturated with a dense and extremely viscous form of petroleum, technically referred to as bitumen, or colloquially as tar, due to its superficially similar appearance. Natural bitumen deposits are reported in many countries, but in particular are found in extremely large quantities in Canada. Other large reserves are located in Kazakhstan, Russia, and Venezuela. The estimated worldwide deposits of oil are more than 2 trillion barrels. The estimates include deposits that have not been discovered. Oil sands reserves have only recently been considered to be part of the world's oil reserves as higher oil prices and new technology enable profitable extraction and processing. Oil produced from bitumen sands is often referred to as unconventional oil or crude bitumen to distinguish it from liquid hydrocarbons produced from traditional oil wells. Methods of oil sands extraction Except for a fraction of the extra heavy oil or bitumen which can be extracted by conventional oil well technology, oil sands must be produced by strip mining or the oil made to flow into wells using sophisticated in situ techniques. These methods usually use more water and require larger amounts of energy than conventional oil extraction. While much of Canada's oil sands are being produced using open pit mining, approximately 90% of Canadian oil sands and all of Venezuela's oil sands are too far below the surface to use surface mining. The Athabasca oil sands are the only major oil sands deposits which are shallow enough to surface mine. In the Athabasca sands, there are very large amounts of bitumen covered by little overburden, making surface mining the most efficient method of extracting it. 
Surface mining uses truck and shovel technology to move sand saturated with bitumen from the mining area to an extraction facility. Surface mining is used to recover oil sands deposits less than 75 meters below the surface. In situ or in place recovery is used for bitumen deposits buried too deeply more than 75 meters for mining to be practical. Most in situ bitumen and heavy oil production comes from deposits buried more than 350 to 600 meters below the surface. Steam Solvents or thermal energy make the bitumen flow to the point that it can be pumped by a well to the surface. Cyclic steam stimulation CSS, and steam-assisted gravity drainage SAGD, are effective in situ recovery methods. SAGD, or Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage, is a thermal production technology which utilizes two parallel horizontal wells known as a well pair, one to inject steam and the other to produce water and oil. Initially, steam is circulated in both wells to establish communication between the wells. The top horizontal well then continuously injects steam to hit the reservoir, creating a steam chamber. The oil from the chamber drains to the production well below to allow for production initially through pressure drive and then by artificial leaf or gas leaf. The steam injection and oil production happen continuously and simultaneously once production starts. This technology has a high ultimate recovery of oil from the reservoir relative to other in situ production technologies. CSS or, or cyclic steam stimulation is a thermal production technology in which one well is used to both inject steam and produce oil. Steam is injected at a pressure high enough that the hydraulic fractures are induced in the reservoir, allowing steam to access and heat new areas of the reservoir. After weeks or even months, the injection cycle is completed. A few days are allowed for the steam to condense and then the production of oil and water begins. Production initially occurs due to increased reservoir pressures, but later cycles require artificial leaf technologies to produce the remaining oil during the production cycle. CSS or cyclic steam stimulation is a viable option for deeper reservoir that have a thick capping shale to manage the high steam injection pressure. The high injection pressure and multiple recovery mechanisms enable CSS to work effectively with a broader range of reservoir, especially with heterogeneous characteristics. No tailing ponds are required for in situ methods of recovery. Sand remains in the ground. Only bitumen is removed. An average of 0.5 barrels of water is used to produce one barrel of synthetic crude oil.
climate and environmental issues of oil sands. Carbon intensity. Oil sands development is carbon intensive. The production and upgrading required to produce synthetic crude oil from oil sands mining results in greenhouse gas emissions in the range of 62 to 164 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per barrel. In in situ development, which is generally which is generally generally more carbon intensive than mining results in emission rates between 99 and 176 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per barrel although there is a high degree of, of variation <clears throat> industry average emissions for oil sands productions and upgradings are estimated to be 3.2 to 4.5 times as in, as intensive per barrel as conventional crude produced in North America. Canadian government reports similarly suggest that GHG emissions from oil sands mining and upgrading are about five times greater than those from conventional light, medium, crude oil production. Even if you look at it from a full life cycle, well to wheels basis, oil sands are overall still one of the most greenhouse gas intensive fuel sources. Water use Producing a barrel of synthetic crude oil from the oil sands by mining requires two to four barrels of fresh water after taking into account water recycling. Companies are currently licensed to withdraw over 590 million cubic meters of water per year, which is roughly equivalent to what a city of 3 million people would require. Water for oil sands mining is pumped from the Athabasca River, a river that fluctuates seasonally as well as year to year and withdrawing water during natural low flow periods which occur primarily in the winter has the potential to harm aquatic life in the river. This water cannot be returned to the river system because it becomes toxic in the extraction process and must be retained in tailing ponds. Tailings. The liquid tailings, a byproduct of the oil sands mining process, contain naphthenic acids, unrecovered hydrocarbons, and trace metals, making it toxic to aquatic organisms and mammals. Operators are required to store tailings waste on site in large containment dikes because the water is too toxic to be returned to the Athabasca River under water quality guidelines. There are currently over 720 billion liters of toxic tailings on the landscape in the Athabasca oil sands area. These ponds cover an area of more than 130 square kilometers. By 2040, these tailings are expected to occupy 310 square kilometers, an area nearly the size of Vancouver. No tailing ponds have been reclaimed to date. One of the major concerns associated with tailing ponds is the migration of pollutants through the ground water system, which can in turn leak into surrounding oil, soil and surface water. There is currently a lack of publicly available information on the rate and volume of seepage from oil sands tailing ponds, 
despite known incidents involving tailings, seepage. A dominant plan for reclaiming liquid tailings at mine closure is to deposit them in end pit lakes. Tailings would be dumped into all mine pits and capped with water from the Athabasca River. This method is unproven. The concern is that the water and tailings layers will mix and there is also some fear that the end pit lakes will be unable to sustain aquatic life. However, many mining projects to date have been approved based on dealing with tailings in this manner. A fully realized end pit lake has not yet been constructed. Noise from propane cannons and floating scarecrows are used to deter migratory birds from landing in the oil slick tailings ponds. The woodland caribou is a threatened species and can be very sensitive to disturbance and habitat loss.